meeting of the Planning and Economic Development Committee of County County Council to order November 19th, 2019. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, the first order of business, I would like a motion to amend the agenda to move uh, a couple of items, and I apologize to committee members, I did not um, speak with you before this. But in talking with Mr. Root and having a very packed uh, agenda, it looks like it's going to be necessary to finish by 4.45. We have a 5 o'clock special council meeting, and we need time to let YouTube um, spool up. So really need to finish by 4.45. Um, being that, I'd like to move, uh, I'd like a motion to move the discussion item regarding the ATAX ordinance to behind the economic development update and then move the billboard um, prohibition or moratorium discussion behind the ATAX. Uh, so it would be economic development update. A tax and then billboard construction. So move. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. So we need to approve the minutes from the August 20th, 2019 meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Any changes, discussion, amendments? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. For discussion, we have an update regarding code enforcement activities in Oconee County. Mr. Mike Stevens. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Let me be here to discuss where we're at, how we get here. There we go. Sorry. Thank you. So we started three months ago. I think I came on board. <coughs> We've developed a process flow. We track items from inception to clearing. And we work through our working process, you know, throughout all that. So at the present time, there we go. So the process is bring in the complaint, verify the jurisdiction, verify zoning, uh, research from top to bottom whether or not there's an IPMC code violation, all the way down to who the owner is and start my engagement. Uh, work with owners, complainants, anybody that can help to resolve <coughs> the issue. And sometimes that's a phone call, sometimes that's a letter. A lot of personal interaction. <clears throat> so far, I haven't issued any citations and no door closures. So we've been successful there. 105 complaints today. That's in 75 days. Um, probably this week, a half a dozen more. Out of those 75, they all fit into 25 categories at the IPMC, and there's four of those that are predominant. They take up 65% of my time. And they're listed here. I have examples on the following page. So I thought pictures would help, kind of the before and after. This is where we have an unsafe and unlawful, unlawful structure. The retaining wall was built to eight feet tall. That requires engineer drawings and permits. None were gained, and the builder did not want to go get engineering plans and specs. So we had him take down the forms, cut down the concrete, to the level that's allowed without a permit, and that's the finished product on the right. So it was more of a safety concern for me than a permitting concern. I'm, I'm more about the safety, and this resolved that for me in short order. This is an issue with grading, erosion, control. The owner had been driving down to the dock, purposely going over silt fences, even built a driveway down to a gravel driveway. Um, once I got a complaint, I was able to find the owner there from out of town. Uh, they were, it was difficult to get a hold of them. We got them, and silt fences were put up, and in fact, the silt fencing was in quit, so it's three times what it was. Oh, well, there we go. 
This is an instance where on the county right away, uh, we had somewhat of a safety issue because it's a narrow road. <coughs> They're unlicensed, unlawful vehicles, unregistered. Uh, I was able to work with the owner to get them moved off as opposed to citing them and getting them towed. Try not to go to that end, more so of uh, personal interaction. This is an issue with garbage. Um, th this is big. We have a lot of these that come up. This is uh, an example of it. And, you know, with one phone call and meeting the gentleman on site, we were able to get it cleaned up uh, with relatively little bit of effort. So those are the four that I probably deal with the most. There are others, and they may or may not be more difficult over time. Okay, this is. Well, I lost my ability. Here we go. Okay, partnerships. Yep. Ed Daniel. Okay. So I put these up here, it's a real pretty page. And I do partner with everybody, the, primarily the Sheriff's Department for escort and getting ideas on how to enforce uh, the, the process. Um, DHEC a lot for the sanitation issues. Uh, Wahala City and the power companies. Uh, we team when we have power, unsafe power issues, we team together. So it's kind of there for picture. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Stevens, very much. I mean, that certainly looks like some things that needed to be addressed, and I'm sure you've got uh, job security there. So uh, does the, the committee have any questions or comments for Mr. Stevens? Thank you. Uh, well, welcome aboard. Appreciate what you do, and also appreciate, um, you know, when we address a concern that we work with the citizen, um, which is what our goal is, you know, and I appreciate them. Uh, being respectful to you and taking care of the situation that probably bothers their their neighbor and probably likewise as, as we work together to be a neighbor community. We are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. All right, next up we have updates regarding the corridor plan slash entryway. Mr. Adam Chap. <coughs> evening, council members. How's it going? Good evening. Well, um, just be a real brief update. At the last planning and economic development meeting, you all asked Planning Commission to look at signs, designs, and landscaping along certain corridors into the county. Planning Commission coupled that with uh, the full council's uh, recommendation to look at certain safety aspects along certain corridors, along 123. And Planning Commission decided to put that all into one basket and work as kind of like a working group <coughs> or subcommittee. So we haven't accomplish anything besides setting up a, a subcommittee for it and we're starting to do some research and, and background work on the corridors. So that's where we are as far as far as that. That's all I've got to report. All right. Any questions or discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up we have an update from 10 at the top trails workshop. Mr. Phil Shirley. I won't be quite as fast as Adam, but I'll be fast. <laughs> um, so 10 at the top, uh, most of you are familiar with them. They're, this is their 10th anniversary, and as part of that, they're doing their, um, they're doing a workshop in each county. Thank you. And for us, uh, when we look at the comp plan, and we talked to OEA, and we talked to Adam, um, we felt like trails and greenways were a great fit for a, uh, a workshop for Oconee County. So. Uh, we pulled together, uh, in partnership with Ten at the Top, a, um, a workshop. And we had three main things that we focused on. One, the question was, are we ready? Uh, Mr. Kane did a really good job of pulling together all the previous plans over the past eight to ten years, talking about um, all the places that we had talked about, trails, connections. Uh, you know, up until this point, it's been a dream. Uh, you know, I feel like now we're kind of taking the dream and turning it into a vision and then we'll look at a plan down the road. Uh, so we, we talked about are we ready? Uh, we heard a Swamp Rabbit success story, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And then we focused a little bit on trails and, and the vision for Oconee County. We had over 100 people, 100 community leaders uh, to show up. Blue Ridge Electric was a, a gracious host. Ten at the top paid for lunch for everyone that usually helps bring them in. And we were able to spend some time. Uh, we heard from two presenters. We heard from Mayor Brandy Amadon from Traveler's Rest, South Carolina to talk about how the Swamp Rabbit has positively impacted Traveler's Rest. And she talked about what it looked like before 
the Swamp Rabbit Trail and what it looks like now. Um, it was very simple. Uh, when you look at the things that, that the Swamp Rabbit Trail has brought, the number of people, uh, the dynamic, the professionals, uh, folks that have expendable income who are coming into the community, spending their money. Um, we also heard from Mr. Ty Hook, who is the director of Greenways uh, with Greenville PRT and has been a major piece of laying that out. And if you've seen that master plan, it's really impressive of what impressive of how long it's going to be when they when they get it complete. So out of their presentations, we, we heard four main things. Uh, we heard that it enhances the quality of life. Both of them were very, very positive on what they've seen in Greenville and Travelers Rest. We've heard that it was an economic driver, both not in the resident, not just the residential, but in the business community as well. And that those folks who are coming and using that trail are being a big influence on what the community development looks like moving forward. Increase the property values. Uh, they're seeing a number of communities now who are targeting um, how can they link to the Swamp Rabbit Trail? How can they be within walking or riding distance to get their community, their development plan close to that trail? Uh, and then boost consumer spending. After we heard from them, uh, we, we talked about what would an Oconee Trail look like? And the, these are the actual maps uh, that were set up in front of you, but uh, Morgan um, and OEA helped me take that and, and make it into a map. And so when you look at what the, what the community asked for when we said, how would you connect Oconee County by land? And how would you connect Oconee, Oconee County on blueways? And if you don't know what a blueway is, it's just a trail by water. And since we're almost surrounded by water, you think about paddling, stand-up paddle boards, canoes, kayaks. There's, there's linkages that we could do in utilizing our waterways as well. So as the first interactive piece, we asked people to think about how would you connect Oconee County? And you can see a number of ways how they connected the major um, cities, communities within Oconee County, as well as connecting over to Clemson University. And we saw that across the room, a very consistent message of what they would like to see. We also asked uh, the, the folks in the room that day, what would you want to see along the trail? And so we had two big boards up that they could go right up. And there's a number, and I can send you a list of everything that was the final, um, final list of what was, was on the trail amenities list. The third piece, uh, which was a little fun, was if you were the deciding factor and could name a greenway across Oconee County, what would you call it? And so it was really cool to see uh, some of the creative names that, that you could come up with across the county. And you always want to ask, uh, if, if you're asking for something, how would you want to pay for it? And so we gave them the same options that we used as part of the comp plan and had them put dots on their first, second, and third options of how you would like to see this paid for if we were to move forward as a county and consider a trail or a greenway. And, it, and these were two separate boards on each side of the room, but they were, they were a pretty consistent message if this is something that we were, we were to consider in the future. This is just a few more pictures of the day. Uh, 120 people or so, I believe, were in the room. Uh, very positive feedback, a lot of interaction. Um, since then, we've had some communications with some neighboring communities who have talked about uh, the things they're doing with like the Green Crescent Trail, uh, the Palmetto Trail, um, Stump House Trail, and how we can connect down the road with connection points. So this is just an update on that day. Uh, I do think that we're taking a step closer to, to trying to figure out how do we connect our communities with non-motorized trails so that we can enhance quality of life. I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. Um, what are the, do we have any next steps or recommendations to this committee for uh, follow-up or is there any, or is it still being done, you know, you'll still work on things internally? As we move through the comp plan, um, I think some of those things will come to light as to where we need to focus our time and energy, and, and I think those will, will bring be brought back at the appropriate time. Okay. Any quest, other questions or comments from council? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Shirley. All right. And now we'll have our economic development update, the, the inaugural e economic development update <laughs> by our new... Eco Oconee Economic Alliance Director, Annie Caggiano. Welcome aboard. Thank you. 
Um, well, I don't have a, a formal presentation this evening, but I just wanted to come and attend the first planning meeting just to introduce myself both to the community, but to um, new members as well because I hadn't met Mr. Elliott yet. But this is my third week on the job. It has been wonderful so far. This is a great community. You can tell there's a lot of passion behind what's going on right now, both on the industrial side but also on the commercial side. So I'm really excited to just build upon what Janet and Richard had done over the last six or seven years and really work to take Oconee to the next level. So that's, that's my goal, and I, I hope to work with everyone here and in the community as well, and I'm really excited. That's all I have for today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, that was uh, short. We may have time to discuss the billboards yet. All right, uh, next up we have a tax uh, by Mr. Root to regarding amending our local accommodations tax ordinance to track more closely with South Carolina State a tax statute and regulation regarding rep collection issues. Yeah, you can flash that. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. They, I, th I would probably <coughs> style this just a cleanup ordinance. Um, Y'all are familiar with the state accommodations tax. We have a local version that's carried within Oconee County uh, Code of Ordinances sections 30-81 through 87. It's clear within the state statute that if you are using or an, an outside entity is collecting the fees um, for a short-term rental, for example, then a certain exemption wouldn't apply because that be an Airbnb or a local real estate agent or whatever would not be the occupant of the home and this exemption flows with or inures to the occupant of a home that has six or less bedrooms and that occupant is there during the time that someone else is staying there. So the state statute makes it clear and the regulation makes it clear that hey if you're using an Airbnb, not picking on that entity, but just for example, then you're not going to be able to, you know, use this exemption because somebody else is furnishing the accommodation. Obviously, the occupant of the home, if you're staying there or not, if you have six bedrooms or not, is Airbnb who's furnishing it, so no exemption. So that is really the cleanup that I wanted to do. Within the state statute, you know, there's a state A tax within the Title 12, which is our tax code for the state. Title 6 that applies to local subdivisions says, all right, local subdivisions, you can have a local accommodations tax. You need to collect it in a similar manner as the state accommodations tax. So in large part, our accommodations tax does track with the state model, but it doesn't have language in there that the states does. And that language I want to include and present it to full council um, at our next meeting would be along these lines. For that exemption, and the exemption that I spoke of, um, would essentially read this way. If you have a facility that consists of less than six sleeping rooms contained on the same premises, which is used as a place of abode of the owner or operator of such facilities, then a tax doesn't apply. The state regulation says for this exception to apply, the facility must serve as the owner's or operator's place of abode during the same time at which the remaining sleeping rooms are rented to transients. And the rooms must not be rented to transients by a person other than the owner or operator using the facility. And then it says C below, and the C below is to a section that talks to real estate agents, <coughs> online travel companies, travel agencies, and the like. So I just really wanted to amend our ordinance to include that language to make it clear that if if you are using this a third-party entity, you're not going to be able to take a lead or, or use this ex uh, exemption. There's another little cleanup in there. I want to make it clear what the penalty is. Um, we have the, the general reference to Section 1, or Title 1, within our, in our Code of Ordinances, Section 7, that you, know, you violate a, a county statute or county ordinance. It's a misdemeanor. It could be a misdemeanor. That wasn't made clear in the, the ordinance, so I want to make that reference. It's also not clear um, within our ordinance who can inspect the records of an entity. It says a code enforcement officer or another designated agent. It doesn't say who that designated agent would be, so I want to bring forward the amended um, version of our ATAX ordinance to say that the code enforcement officer or a designated um, agent or representative 
from the county administrator or des as designated by the county administrator. So those are three amendments. So really we just need a motion to uh, for the county administrator to draft up amendments to the ATAX ordinance as discussed, if that suits you all. I'll make the motion. Second. Second. Stated. Then what did I say? Second. You? Motion okay. second. second. Any yeah. discussion on the uh, proposed changes to the ordinance? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Root. Sure. And I and think I said that the county yeah. administrator was going to make that uh, draft that <laughs> amendment. That was a misspeak. She doesn't want to sign up for that. So <laughs> I'm going to do that. <clears throat> okay. Do you have no, a prefer that too, of when promise. you would that would be brought before council? Would that be the December 17th meeting? I think that's a realistic time frame. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Mr. Smith, that. can you make a note of that? Okay. All right. Well, we looks like we will make it. I don't know if we'll get finished with this topic, um, but I think we still have ample time to at least begin a discussion. We have about 20 minutes before we need to stop at 4:45. Um, regarding <coughs> discussion of a moratorium or prohibition on future billboard construction, and Mr. Root had emailed out some some notes here um, that he would like for us to give thought to and I hope that everybody has had a chance to review these if not um, we can certainly discuss yeah. them you know from the hip yeah, I'll guide us through if that okay. works for you and just yeah. kind of help facilitate the discussion and see where we land and see where we need to go next this was a matter that was brought up um, in council a while back discussion executive session as it relates in large part to or at that point to the legal basis and, and y'all received legal advice as to the viability of doing that and in general terms you can do it um, you can do a ban on billboards there have been other jurisdictions who do that there have been jurisdictions within South Carolina numerous ones within this within the nation who have done it and where they've been found to be lawful is if they're anchored to two primary driving factors. One, let's ameliorate or, or try to at least lessen distracted driving. And then two, also, hey, we're doing this because of aesthetics. We want the community to look better. So when the ordinance, ordinances are geared towards solving or, or helping to mitigate those problems, courts have found them to be solid ordinances to withstand any kind of judicial scrutiny. <coughs> That said, when you're going to tinker with the sign code and you're going to treat different types of, we'll just use, say, signs for all of them, be it a billboard or a sign, because they're defined differently within our ordinance now, it needs to be content neutral. You essentially have to treat all manner of speech the same way. So it's something to, to bear in mind as we go down this road. So as I understood it, essentially in, in very loose terms, the notion was, that can we stop the construction of billboards as they're commonly thought of. And I think as they're commonly thought of, large signs that are off-premises, meaning they're advertising for an entity or service that is not at the same place that the sign or billboard is. Um, so things that you see going down the highway or, or, or a smaller uh, thoroughfare or roadway that are advertising for some other place um, and, and these are things that some folks would commonly think of as being unsightly and perhaps leading to accidents because they distract drivers because of size. And obviously they're meant to grab your attention. You know, they wouldn't be effective if they weren't. So with that background in mind, I had questions that I posed to you all in the email. I can you know, work through those uh, for this discussion. The first one was to see if you all wanted or we're looking towards an ordinance revision or a tack on to the ordinance or a standalone provision really that was something more akin to a moratorium which would mean hey, we're going to stop new billboards from going up for a short period of time or we want to amend the sign ordinance to preclude new, new billboards from being constructed to the foreseeable future. And I think the latter was what you all talked about um, I just want to make sure that question was answered for my part so I didn't bring back an ordinance that didn't meet 
what y'all are talking about. I'm seeing nods of your head, so I think that's you, you're looking for a ladder. So a revision for our, our sign ordinance that covered certain sign structures. We'll just call them billboards at this point. So the next item to, to think about is I've given this very you know, kind of general definition of what a billboard is. Is how you all would define a billboard. And by that I mean we're sticking with the notion of something that's off premise. Uh, are we sticking with a certain size? And, that, and that's the, the big uh, thing, thing that y'all need to discuss because certain off premise billboards might still be of a size that are not objectionable to you all, to the goals. If you're seeking to lessen distracted driving, you're seeking to lessen the impact on the scenery, certain sizes may not be objectionable. So that would be the first issue that, that I would put to you all to discuss, to think about. So the size, <coughs> excuse me, the size, the face area of the billboard, and does that include the accompanying um, border? Or a structural component? At this point in time, it's, it's kind of wild west for you all. It, it can or it need not. As, as it is now, as it's defined in our code, is it, we look for the sign and face. Um, and for billboards, those are generally, they usually do not have like a sign on premise does. They usually don't have a lot of architecture that surrounds the, the actual sign. They're usually the sign is the structure for the most part, except for some monopole or whatever holding it up. Um, so as we have billboards off premises, we reference at the maximum of 675 square feet of sign face essentially. Um, and that billboards are generally going to be between 75 square feet and I think it's 75 and 675 or 672. Yeah, 672. And the minimum, the minimum size is? Well, it says 50, but really a bill, it really billboard is defined by its location within our ordinance more than its size at this point. So it's, <coughs> if it's off premise, if it's you know a sign for Oconee County Pine Street Administrative Offices and it's at the school district, then that's that's an off premise advertisement. If it's, if it's right there on the parking lot, then it's on premises. So that's the first notion. Are y'all good with a, a certain size that would be okay or, or not? My biggest, I don't have a concern with on-premises signs for advertising your business or something like that. I think, you know, the group signs that seem to be the most popular, like my office park has, like most new office parks have, where there's a stack sign all the way down, um, seems to be not just in Oconee County, but not just in South Carolina, um, seems to be the way to go. I'm not, I'm not in favor of having... Let's say you take Hartwell Village, for example, and every person down there had the ability to put up an individual sign, and it was pole signs all the way down there. I'm not in any way in favor of that because it kind of defeats the purpose of what an actual sign and advertisement would be. Um, but on-premises signs for an individual's business, I, I have no issue with that. I think we've addressed that the last time when we talked about the signs. We decided on the exact sign for on-premises signs, uh, whether it be from Borg Warner through the industries that we talked about, um, or it be um, anybody's personal business as well. And I think we addressed that pretty good. I think we had a lot of um, things come up through that. Uh, to me, this is more of an off-premise um, issue. To, to this seems to be a big issue, not just in Oconee County, but all throughout the United States now. Um, you know, people used to seem like the first thing they did in there was put how far billboards needed to be apart. And then they'd end up, because they were having six to seven in a row, Coney County had an issue like that, and you can see several of them constructed where the billboard in front of it's actually blocking the sign and behind it, and it's the same company that owns those same signs. Um, We've addressed that issue as well, it seems, um, after those came up. Um, so a lot of the billboard issues have been addressed. This kind of takes it to uh, another level, and as a person that's used the, a billboard to advertise his business before, 
Um, I see both sides to it. But I think, um, to me, for the actual number of billboards that are out there and the number of vacant billboards that are out there, um, those that I've talked to that sell billboards uh, for a living uh, feel actually pretty comfortable with this because the amount of um, billboards they have out there. Their construction on some of the older ones is actually better than what some of the new ones were constructed by. Um, and I know we worked on that. It was long before I came on there, the actual way that those are constructed. Um, and uh, I think some of the colors on some of them could be a little better for Oconee County. Um, I'll, I'll let people make their own decision on that. Um, you know, some of the illuminated ones were distracted by a multitude of things. I mean, our phones first off, um, so if we're going to get into driving distractions, we better make a long list. So uh, beautification is really where I see the billboard issue more than distracted driving because distracted driving is, you know, a huge issue. But to me, I look at it as a beautification issue. Um, but also look for the owner's rights, which is why I feel like the off-premises sign is where my focus is. Okay, so so I'm out for defining a billboard as off-premise. Did you say 50 feet to 670 feet? 675 feet? 72. Yeah. 672. Fifty square feet to six hundred seventy-two square feet. So it would, that would retain the same definition that we have for billboard now. Obviously, the, the ordinance in whole would just be tailored to exclude future construction of those. And, and if, I don't know, Mr. Kane, if you spoke, are you good with that definition, just keeping uh, with our definition? So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Do we need to, what, what do you think is the most efficient structure of this? Should we vote on each of these or just through the discussion you're going to get understand where we're going? Through the discussion, yeah. I'll get where the committee's going. I'll draft up the ordinance and bring it back to the committee so then y'all can you know, dig into it. You'll have a document in front of you to, to know the architecture of that document, what you want to move around, shift around, get rid of, see really how it looks on paper. Um, so we'll just get the theoretical notion here. And, and I would like it to go straight from from you and Amanda back to this committee, not go to the planning commission. They're dealing with the ten-year plan. They have plenty to do, and I think I think within this committee would be good. Would have the chance to, to dialogue over it more than say for council. Um, so it makes sense to come back here uh, at the next step. So if we have that defin, stay consistent with the definition of billboard that's in the ordinance now. The the question would be a couple questions. One, we're just going forward. Uh, this isn't a matter of. Um, removing any billboards for, for any reason that are existing right now that would otherwise be okay. They haven't been abandoned or become abandoned. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Unless one that w was addressed as a safety concern through code for some reason. But if it is abandoned, then it could come down. Yeah, right. And then, so we, we still have that provision. That wouldn't need to be altered any. A couple of things that may want to take into consideration or may not, we have X number of billboards within the county now. Um, some other jurisdictions have allowed for this, a notion of a net neutrality kind of deal where right, we've got an inventory within the county of 100 billboards. If one of the billboards comes down for one, whatever reason, then we're going to allow a permitting for another billboard to go up. So you remain at this equilibrium if, if you're at that point now. Um, so that's something that can be included within the ordinance or not. It's just something that, to give consideration I'm not to. I'm for allowing a certain number. Yeah, I, I agree with John on that. The, uh, I mean, again, the, I, I, last time I drove out to Westminster a couple weeks ago, there's still, I think there's 12 total billboards or billboard sides that still say advertise here. So, you know, Supply and demand tells me got enough billboards, and those have been that way as far you know several years. I'd say four, four years. Um, so I, I don't think we're, we're lacking billboards. And, and in case anybody wants to go build a billboard, they can go do it right now. Um, we're talking about a potential code change that would restrict billboards in the future. Um, so if anybody wants to go build one, go build one. Go see Mr. Chapman. Um, but. 
it's my intent that we would not have new billboards um, or new billboards be able to be built even if one comes down that would not you would not have a hundred available and anybody can go get a permit it would it would over time that would as they rebuilt or as they're torn down they would not be rebuilt I don't have a problem I don't have a problem if we allow the billboards on the interstate I feel like that's a different set of circumstances uh, that, yeah that's the question down <laughs> that I have down there are there going to be particular areas by virtue of some characteristic of that area where New, new billboards are not going to be prohibited. I mean, you drive up and down the interstates of this country, I mean, at least the ones I've been on, and there's billboards all up and down them, and I think that's just assumed that that would be the case. I will say, um, as we're trying to continue to attract tourists to Oconee County, if you're coming in from Georgia on exit one, um, yeah, it would be my hope that one day that interchange, at least exit one, would be beautified um, to make it attractive to two tourists coming in. Um, I don't, I can't think, I assume there's billboards there now. I think there are, but um, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't like billboards being on, even on the interstate, but I feel like that's, that's what people do, and people come to expect that, and maybe even appreciate that as signage as they're looking for a place to eat, you know, along the exit. Versus when you're in the community, um, it's 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 much lower traveled roads than than I-85, which I think has 80 to 100 thousand cars per day, and uh, maybe even more than that. Um, so I, I'm not totally opposed to. Uh, billboards being constructed on the I-85 corridor, but we would need to talk about spacing and proximity. Um, that you know, it must be within a certain distance to I-85. I would think. And we have the 1,300 feet between billboards at this point. Um, keep that as is for any new construction. I-85 being an example of what y'all may be inclined to allow or not, and you want to exclude by way of the proposed ordinance. Um, but you're saying within so many feet of the right of way. Yeah. Because what it what is means we would just need to find how close to I-85 it has to be. Yeah, and and I don't remember the there's linear feet in some model ordinances that, that have done the same thing. I don't remember what those are. But I think they're pretty much a function of what's, you know, what's functional for a billboard. Folks don't want to put them too far off the interstate. <laughs> Just as a matter of course, it's not, it doesn't become too effective you know, mm -hmm. if they're buried in the woods. But I'll find out what that is, and I'll get some proposals. Well, I'm just thinking, <clears throat> it, from some of the roads that intersect with the, with the interstate, someone may try to put a billboard. Right within that right of way, or, you know, say it's an I-85 billboard, but it might be facing perpendicular to the interstate. I don't know why you do that, but who knows. Or they might put it at a 45 degree angle and really try to capture both those. We just need to have some sort of black letter rule of distance, maximum distance from the right of way, I think, for the interstate. If we're going to allow new billboards to be constructed there. Right. Understood. And, and this is, we're fortunate, like I said, this isn't, we're not inventing a wheel, so I've reviewed a lot of them, a lot of different ordinances that have gone down the same path, and there are some that provide for that, so that I'll give those options. I think it's like six, 700 feet off the right-of-way, and the right-of-way is not just the side of the mm -hmm. road, so right. it would actually be another six, A couple seven, of football six, fields. Yeah. Yeah. Increasing the size of an existing billboard. So we got one that's 100 feet, and someone wants to move it up to 672. Or I would be opposed to that. Um, I, again, I don't want to make the billboards bigger or add more of them. If you want a billboard, go build a billboard. Right. Now. Here's your warning. <laughs> um, and then if you know next next election people don't like what we did, they can put new people in these seats and they can change the law back. That's the beauty of of the United States of America. And, it is. And, and, and more fairness to this committee, 
we're, this is a this is the first I won't say jam session for, for this you know revision. It's going to come back to you all. Then it'll go to council. It'll take three readings and a public hearing. So there'll be plenty of time to chime in for for the community. Absolutely. And, so um, let's see what else we had. I would want to include so so you're not surprised. I I will put into our sign code when I bring it back with the revisions some language as to um, temporary signage. We don't have anything that goes to, uh, obviously political signs come to mind. Um, still needs to be content neutral. And we can draft it as such, but I was surprised we never did anything with that with political signs or other signs that can end up essentially constituting litter. You know, once a election is over or can just be, uh, you know, an eyesore or, or overdone. Um, we don't have anything that speaks to those, and we don't. Uh, so with your leave, I'll put some language in there that y'all can do with what you want, but we just, it's just something that hasn't been addressed today. Obviously, elections are... There is a state open. requirement on how soon those have to be taken down after election and the time period that those could be up. There's some, there's some state laws that, that speak to it. Um, there you can obviously be more, it can't be less restrictive than the state law, but you can be more restrictive <coughs> than the state law in this case. Let's see if I had any more questions. No, I think I, I think I have a good working idea of what to bring back to the committee. Unless y'all had other thoughts on changes. We've got about two more minutes here uh, before we need to stop. Does anybody have any other discussions in specifically on billboards? Now, I know the Planning Commission is talking, uh, as Mr. Chapman mentioned earlier, about along the corridors and some of the safety concerns. I'm just thinking about both plantings when you pull up to Say 123. That's the obviously the the one of the worst places to try to turn left um, in the county, um, and uh, go head on down to Greenville, and it's tough to turn left all the way along that that, that highway. Um, both planting such as shrubs or trees that are close to the road when you pull up to an intersection pull out up to a driveway and you're looking left or right and you're trying to turn out of there. If those are planted within, I don't know, however many feet, DOT certainly doesn't regulate that. So it seems to me that we, if they're not going to do it, we probably should consider that. I know that the planning commission or, the, or their special committee is considering that. But with regard to signs, I would think that we would want some spacing regardless of what kind of sign it is where a standard vehicle, I don't know what, what height, a there's a height range, whether it's a, a Mazda Miata all the way up to a uh, lifted truck, you know, that we may want to consider if you're going to have it a certain distance from the road, there needs to be a space where you can see out either side. The National Safety Transportation Board already has minimums for visibility of um, vehicles that are registered in states for vehicle safety on roadways. Okay. Like our stop signs here, I wanted them a little bit lower, but we can't because there's that standard for the height clearance. If we could use that model and maybe bring that back to you, that would work. That sounds great. Perfect. I think your, your shrubbery issues are the new thing is rocks. Maybe yeah. putting large rocks on the side to keep people from turning over the grass, and that's seeming to be a big issue. But, but uh, Whatever it is, I think if it's far enough off the road, then it's not a concern. But when you're the first car and you're about to turn right or left onto a busy road and there's no signal, so you're just, it's, your, it's at your own risk that you're going out there. Uh, I, th I think from a safety standpoint, things either need to be pulled back or there needs to be a required space, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, that the NTSB is, is talked about. And that can be, you know, 12 inches or less would be fine for a small sure, shrub. Sure, sure. But anything within that field of visibility in a standard car that is rated to ride on the roads in South Carolina. 
they do have that scale. Okay. The major concern here is safety for our citizens. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't have anything else. David, do you have anything else that, that we need to discuss? No, sir. I'm good. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.